talking about what we believe as Nazarenes. Uh, there have been a lot of things that have been questioned or asked, and, and uh, in a lot of ways, this really comes from you. This next couple sermons that I'm going to be doing come from you. You have asked me questions. Um, you've come to me and said, well, if this is what we stand for, then what is this? Or how does this work? Or those kind of things. So what I've done is I've tried to put uh, probably three, it's probably going to take me three sermons to get through it all. Uh, but I've kind of tried to put things together in a way that will help you to understand what Nazarenes believe as we walk with Christ. You have to realize that, you know, Nazarene is a denominational name. But the truth is we're all followers of Christ. And whether we are in a denomination or a non-denomination or a self-proclaimed whatever, um, truth be known, if you serve Christ Jesus, we are all brothers and sisters. And so, this is not in any way meant to be exclusive. It's really just supposed to be a little bit informational. Now, those of you who come here all the time, you know this about me, but I'm going to say it for the benefit of those who might be a little more newer, because we do have some newer folks here today. Um, I was not willing to preach this from our manual. I was not willing to go into the rules and the regulations of the denomination and put this together so that I could share it with you. Instead, I went to the Holy Scriptures. And I looked at what God was saying, and I prayed fervently. Um, some of you know who you are um, when, when you came to me and said, we really need to do something about people understanding who we are. You know that wasn't a couple weeks ago. It's actually been a few months ago. And that's because I wanted to take the time to pray and to listen so that God could give me the message, not so that I could tell you what we believe. Okay? So, that's where we're going to go for the next few weeks. Um, there is a disclaimer in there, and I'll share that as I get there. But, uh, just so you know, that's kind of what I'm talking about. So, I want to start out, right off the bat, with some statistics. We all love statistics, right? Uh, statistics. Um, I know that, uh, well... Let me just be really honest. I don't really like statistics. The only thing I like about statistics is when somebody says something about a statistic, I want to make sure I'm not part of it. You know? I don't want to be a statistic. And it's really funny. I'm going to throw something out there that I wish she had stayed in here, but she's got the nursery today, that happens every time we run into, Barb and I run into anybody from our high school. Every time... If we're not together, they say to us, Oh, are you still with Barb? Oh, are you still with Ed? We've been married for almost 34 years. And nobody, probably including us, nobody thought we would make it. Nobody. Barb was a really good girl. I wasn't a good guy. Believe it at that. Okay? God does amazing things. Amen. And God blessed our relationship. Amen. And God has been the glue that has held us together. Praise the Lord. We've raised three children. We spent a week. Thank you for letting me go. We spent a week with our kids and our grandkids just this last week. And it was really neat to be in one place with all of them at the same time. First time that's happened. So, thank you for your involvement in that, but just want you to know God makes a difference. I don't like statistics, but these statistics might matter to some of you. So, this information comes from Wikipedia. I know that most of you know that if it's on the internet, it's true. And so, I went to the best site I could think of that, you know, has the most diverse um, anybody can go in and edit with it. Anybody. But you can check this information because it's really pretty good, pretty, pretty close. And that's where I started and I went, ah, oh, okay, they got it right, so I'm going to use it. So, the Church of the Nazarene. 
is an evangelical Christian denomination that emerged from the 19th century holiness movement in North America. It's the largest Wesleyan holiness denomination in the world. The largest Wesleyan holiness denomination in the world. A lot of you, before you came here, had never heard of what a Nazarene was. Never heard of Nazarene, except for maybe when you were reading about Jesus being from Nazareth. Maybe you put that together. But you didn't know what a Nazarene was. It's the largest Wesleyan holiness denomination in the world. At the end of September 2014, the Church of the Nazarene had 2,295,106 members. In 29,395 churches in 159 world areas. Most of the members of the Church of Nazarene are found here in the United States. There's over 600,000 Nazarenes in the United States. But Mozambique, Brazil, India, Bangladesh, Guatemala, Haiti, all have a lot. Over 64,000 Nazarenes in each one of those places. So it's not a small denomination, even though we just, we just passed the 100 year mark. We're, we're not a small denomination by any means. We're just not as well known as some. We haven't been around as long as some. So that's really the main reason why I felt that it did make sense to try to tell you a little bit about who we are. Since its inception, the Church of the Nazarene has indicated that its mission is to respond to the Great Commission of Christ, to go and make disciples in all the nations. That's the theme of our church. That's who we are as a denomination. Since 2001, there's been three core values that they've really, really pushed, that they've really used to identify them as a church, as a denomination. Those three core values are Christian first, holiness second, and missional third. Really, if you think about those three things, you can't do holiness until you do Christian. You can't do missional until you do Christian and holiness. It just doesn't work. So they have built on each other. Today, I'm really not planning to hit a whole lot on any of them. I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of an overview. And then in the next two sermons, I'm going to try to break that down a little more for you. The Church of the Nazarene supports 53 educational institutions in 35 countries on six continents around the world. And the enrollment is over 50,000 students. That, that statistic comes from 2013. Now, I'm pretty sure that number is actually a lot bigger. And I'll tell you why I think that. Because being on this region, we are we are all set up as regions, and in this region, our college, or our university, is in Nashville. It's where Megan Seitz and Christy Martin go to school, Trevecca, Nazarene University. And I get an email from them at least, at least once a quarter telling me about how things are going on campus. For the last four years straight, they have said at the beginning of the year, enrollment is up, which means there's more people looking at the colleges, which means there's more people probably enrolled, which means in the last two or three years, that number's probably gone up. I was able to remind myself of many of the things that have happened in this denomination. I, I was reminded of many of the, the things that I learned in school and as I, some of you know this too, I kind of really like history. So as I've done some studying in the history of the church, I was able to remember a lot of those things as I <coughs> went over how to put together this sermon. And so I asked Bart 
if she would set up a little display, which she did, it's out there right outside the door in the foyer on the left. If you picked up a bulletin, that they're in the front part of that display. The bulletin, and then there's a couple magazines there. There are Holiness Today magazines, which by the way, you can buy a subscription for for very little. But that's not why I have it out there. Those two magazines that are there really cover a lot of who we are as a denomination. One of them gives you a whole lot of the history behind us, and the other one gives you a whole lot of the what we call the Articles of Faith, which is what we have built our church on. Okay? So if you'd like those, they'll be there for the next few weeks. You can pick one up, take it home, and it's yours. You don't have to bring it back. I have lots of them. Okay? So they're there for you. So, now that I got through all the statistics and all the, what I'd like to say is not so important stuff, <clears throat> although it probably is important, because we do need to know who we are, I would like to start all over by considering what the scripture tells us and why it matters to us as people who claim to be a part of a church family. Let's read Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. It says this, so this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impure impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as you, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be rewarded in the spirit, or, I'm sorry, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which and the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. You can see from this reading that we're all called to grow in our faith. If you read this and you and you really look at what it's saying, and you can look at it in context, there's some verses before there that go with this as well. You can kind of see that We're supposed to lay aside our old life. We're supposed to begin to take on or become a new person with a new mindset, which results in a whole new way of life. So we lay aside the old life so that we can take on the new life. For this to happen, we have to have a spiritual encounter of some kind. That spiritual encounter will enlighten us to gain insight into what we are and what we decide to follow. I hope I don't get in trouble for this. But Krista and I, we're kind of on the same page about how worship goes. And yet, sometimes we're, we feel a little bit hindered, stifled. Sometimes, she's shaking her head, so I'm okay, I can keep going. <laughs> uh, sometimes we feel like really want to do more of this. I really want to go further with this. But don't take offense. But if you're one of these people, we get really scared. <laughs> there are some of you that sit out there and you scowl at us. You make us feel like, ooh, better not to sing another song. We better not 
do another song like that anyway. Sometimes we get really, and, and, and you know the truth is we understand it's not about me. It's not about Krista. It's not even about you. It's about him. Amen. But sometimes we feel like, okay, it's time to stop. And even though we know in our spirit that God's saying, go, go. These words that I just used, they can be scary words. Some of you, when I said words like mystical, you instantly thought, Ooh, uh, I don't know. You see, mystical sounds Eastern. And Eastern scares us. Because we don't understand Eastern. Because we're Western. That's really what it comes down to. Any of you who are teachers who have taught any history, you know I'm right. But, see, a lot of us aren't teachers, and a lot of us haven't studied history, and a lot of us just see Eastern as scary. They are different. They do things different than us. Mystical is one of those words that make us question. A spiritual encounter. Why don't you say, we need to be saved? We need to be born again. The truth is, we do. That's what a spiritual encounter is. But here's the thing. I'm not telling you to get mystical. Nor am I telling you to follow any of the enlightenment groups. I'm simply saying for you and I to truly understand spiritual things. The things that Christ leads us to follow. We have to have an understanding. We have to accept the Holy Spirit into our lives. We have to give Him freedom to draw us into a new mindset. That mindset will line up with Jesus and His teachings. That's the mindset. That's the enlightenment. That's the mystical thing I'm talking about. The thing that draws us into that relationship with Jesus the Christ. That's where we need to go. I believe it's good for us to be reminded of who we are. I believe it's good for us to understand where we come from and where we're going. That's the reason that I've chosen to share this series of messages. <coughs> now, I want to stop right there and say this is kind of strange. We're starting a series that talks about who we are, what we believe, where we came from, and yet next week we're going to have our district superintendent with us. And I thought very seriously about asking him to preach to us about what it means to be Christian. I really thought hard about saying to him, we're going to start this series. To be very honest, he would have loved that. I know that. He would have taken that and gone all over the place with it because I know Dr. Dennis well. And this is his thing. So he might anyway. But instead I chose to wait and let him bring us what God's telling him to bring us. So I'm going to take a week off. We're going to start this today. And we're going to take a week off and then I'm going to come back on the 24th and pick up where we're leaving off today. This is what I know about Dr. Dennis. I know that he has been and will continue to be praying about what God wants to share with us. And it might be a little bit selfish, but part of why I didn't say to him, here's where I am, here's what I'm preaching on, would you just take one of these series, these sermons in the series and, and preach on it? Part of why I didn't do that is because I have this spiritual feeling that he's going to bring something that I need. And to be true, well, I've been studying what we're doing on these core values. So I'm looking forward to what he's going to bring, and I hope you will come, and I hope you will find something in what he says 
that will speak on your own. <coughs> My plan today and through the next few weeks is to share with you three values that distinguish us, not only as Christians, but also as people who are called Nazarenes. Our values are important. You know that? Every one of you here has values for every area of your life. Every one of you has a way of living. The values that you have determine how you live. The decisions that you make every day help shape your values as well as influencing the things that go on around you. It's kind of a cause and effect type of thing. They go hand in hand. Your values and how you react, what you do, how you live, go together. For example, if I'm in Walmart, and I know none of us go to Walmart, right? But if I'm in Walmart and the cashier girl is just a little bit spacey, and we all know that never happens, but she's just a little bit spacey, she checks out my groceries, my whatever I got, and she takes my money and she hands me back $10 more than I was supposed to get. I'm questioning my values. See, I can't take that $10 and say, oh, Thanks, God. You must have given this to me so that I can pay my bills better, so that I can stop at McDonald's and get two sandwiches and a, and a glass of Coke for $10. And you may th say, oh, this is her fault. She should have done a better job. That is an option. Or your values may say, I can't do this. This girl doesn't make that much money. At the end of the day, her drawer is going to be short, and she's going to have to pay that. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to steal this. I'm going to take this back and give this to her. You see, your values matter. What we value will determine the choices that we make. Your values affect where you eat. Will it be McDonald's or Wendy's or Subway? Some will pick a restaurant because of the taste buds, right? I, I go to McDonald's because I really like their fries, right? I'm going to Wendy's because they use sea salt. I'm going to Subway because they're just nothing in compares. It could be our taste buds. It could be because you get more for your buck. It could be because it's clean or it's dirty or it's fast or it's slow. Whatever is of value to you will help you decide where you're going to eat. All right? Obviously, our values come into play in our spiritual walk as well. We see them in our commitment to the church. Remember that our values are determined by our choices, or our choices are determined by our values. However you want to look at that because they kind of go back and forth. <clears throat> a lot of people claim with their mouth to be Christian. Right? A lot of people claim, yes, I'm a Christian. You know, I talk to people all the time and they tell me, oh yeah, I go to such and such a church. The problem is that I have friends that go to such and such a church. And so I'll be talking to them about something and I'll say, oh yeah, I was talking to so-and-so the other day. And they're like, who's that? Well, they go to your church. Oh, well, I've only been there for a couple years, so maybe... Right? I'm not trying to be judgmental here in any way. I just want you to understand what I'm trying to say. Our values really do determine who we are. A lot of people claim to be Christian with their mouth. But based on what they do and the choices they make, it would be hard to say that they're living. If I value my relationship with God, I'm going to spend time with God. I'll pray and talk with Him. I say that because a lot of us talk to God but don't pray. Because prayer means two-way. Which means we have to listen as well. 
I'll read and I'll study His Word, which reveals His plan for my life. I'll worship. That doesn't mean sing. That means worship. It's different. We can talk about that later. <laughs> These are going to be choices that I make because I value my relationship with Christ. Listen to me this morning. When I value this relationship with Jesus, these are not things that I have to do. They're things that I want to do. It's not like I do them so that I don't feel guilty or so that I feel better about myself. Instead, they're things that I choose to do because I want to be with Him. There's a huge difference in that. Huge difference in that. As a Christian, not only will I value my relationship with Jesus, but I also value my fellowship with other believers. Coming to church to worship. I know nobody wants to be told that they have to go to church. And, and I've been there and I've even agreed with many people who have told me, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. That's true. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. But when you try to live a Christian life by yourself, you tend to fall. You need support. You need encouragement. You need help. And, and listen to this, you need to serve. You need to also help. You need to also support. You need to also care. It goes both ways again. That's why we need a church. We come to church to worship. We come to church to pray together. We come to share our gifts and talents with the body. We give our tithe. We become committed to our fellow church members. These are the values that are vitally important to Christian, to Christianity, to people who walk with Christ. So the question becomes, what is it that you value? The choices you make will point you to the answer. I say all that so that you'll hear me say this. The Church of the Nazarene has values as well. We who join ourselves to this denomination also confess to believe in the things our church has deemed important. We align ourselves with these teachings because they have influenced us. Or maybe because they've convinced us to their importance in our lives. That's another reason for membership. We attend, we support, we help, we give, and we do all of this because we believe in what we stand for as a body of believers trying to live for Christ. Trying to live His teachings as they're shared through the Holy Scriptures. This morning I want to share with you about what the Church of Nazarene stands for and believes. I believe this is important because as someone who has joined this denomination or someone who is considering joining this denomination, this congregation, we have a responsibility to show other people who don't know or who don't understand who we are, what we believe. Does that make sense? Anybody out there? Mm -hmm. I guess I could say like this. For us to truly be called Nazarenes, we need to determine if our values match up with what we say we believe. Right? That fair? Okay. So, there's three distinct values. We hold, we hold to these values as we join ourselves to this movement called the Church of the Nazarene. They are that we are a Christian people. This means that we join all true believers in proclaiming the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That we embrace the Trinitarian creedal statements of the Christian church or of the Christian faith. That means that we believe 
in the Trinity. We believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what that says. It's basic for most of us. Anyone who claims to follow Jesus as Lord is part of this group. Christian means little Christ or follower of Christ. So, we who become Christian take on the form of Christ. And if we're truly following Him, we become like little Christs. Maybe it would be easier for you to understand if I said this. We become Jesus's mini-me's. Does that work better? <laughs> we become like Jesus. The more we walk, the more we read, the more we study, the more we live, the more like Jesus we should be becoming. We're also a holiness people. This means that we believe God, who is holy, calls us to a life of holiness. Now I want you to stay with me. So listen and stay with me. Everything I say about this holiness thing, I believe. It pertains to me, just like you. So don't take it like I'm trying to be judgmental again. I'm not. Honestly, this might even be a little more on me. Because I stand in this thing called a pulpit. And I don't take that very lightly. So what I'm saying, I really do believe. And I believe it's scriptural. We believe the Holy Spirit himself performs the work in us as we realize we cannot live as God asks us to live on our own. As we grow in our faith and realize who Christ is and how he's calling us, what he's calling us to become, we gain an understanding that we cannot live a truly Christian lifestyle. We all fail and we all fall short of the glory of God. Ever read, ever read that? Mm -hmm. It's scriptural. But when we realize that he has provided more for those who will listen, we begin to search for a holy infill. When we realize that we can't do it, we begin to search for more and ask God to make himself more real to us. And at that point, we understand that there is a Holy Spirit and that he will help us live. This is when things truly change because this is when we begin to realize how sinful we are without Him. I know it's hard to swallow, but until we come to the point where we realize we can't live this life, this Christian life, like God has asked us to live, until we come to that point, we live in denial. And once we come to that point, we realize how sinful we really are. If you'll truly look at passages like Romans 12, 1 and 2, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 24, and Hebrews 12, 14, you'll see that the scriptures call us to more than just a salvation experience. There's more. And we can live it. And we can be different. Those of us who claim to be Christian and want to be more than just a nice fixture on a seat, I know that's none of you, but more than just a nice fixture on a seat in church on Sunday morning, we should realize that we have much more to do than just say a prayer and expect everything to be okay from there. We're a holiness denomination because we believe God expects us to be holy as He is holy. Again, scriptural. You can read that statement almost word for word in 1 Peter 1.16. And 1 Peter is quoting Leviticus. So it's Old and New Testament saying, Be holy as I am holy. That doesn't mean, oh preacher, we're human. We have to just be who we are and let God figure it out. 
No, it means be holy as I am. Leviticus 11, 44-45. I know some of you write these down and look them up, but I'm going to give them to you. Leviticus 19, 2. Also 20, verse 7, and verse 26. And I checked the First Peter passage. I checked it in like seven or eight different uh, translations. So that you would all know that when I'm standing here saying this to you, I don't care which version you read it. It's still going to tell you to be holy. <coughs> so go and check it out. And read around it. And keep reading. Because you'll never find anything bad if you keep reading the scripture. Mm -hmm. Last, we're missional people. This means that we believe we are sent into the world to spread the good news of the Messiah who came to earth to bring salvation. He came to earth to give us a way of living holiness to all, in front of all, who will watch, who will listen. We are sent to go and tell what God is doing in our lives. Remember the statistics I shared this morning? This is the evidence of our mission. It's the evidence that our church, our denomination, is doing what we say we believe. Let me remind you one more time. Most of the members of the Church of the Nazarene are found in the United States. 631,454 in 2014. Mozambique has 157,119. Brazil, 111,694. India, 107,175. Bangladesh, 79,550. Guatemala, 78,212. And Haiti has 64,071 members. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I bet if I ask, if you're not a member here, would you raise your hand? I am sure that there are people here that are not members. As a matter of fact, I know there's people here that are not members. Which means that this number is actually bigger as well. Because people go to church that are not members of the church. That's okay. They're going looking for God. Praise God. Amen. Let them go. Let them grow. If they choose, if they feel God telling them to become a member, good. If not, let them go. Let them grow. Let them walk. Let them be part of our family. Because... It's about making a difference for Jesus, not about building a membership role. Amen. Ever. My intention today, for the next few weeks, is to inform you of what the Church of the Nazarene believes as a denomination. That's my intention. My prayer is that you'll receive, you'll hear and receive from God. My hope is that, you'll, that is that you'll take what you hear and you'll commit to intentionally living it in all aspects of your life. That's truly where I want you to go. I don't want you to say, oh, I'm so glad Pastor Ed shared about what Nazarenes believe. Now I know what I believe. No. This book here is called the Holy Bible. This is what you believe. This is what you should live. Amen. If you choose to be a Nazarene to learn this more, praise God. Welcome. Thank you. But it's not about a membership. It's about serving Christ, living for God, walking daily in His Spirit, and allowing Him to make us into His image, into little Christ. That's where we really need to focus. So let me close my sermon by reading the scripture one more time for you. It says, I, I just want to end with you hearing the scripture. It says, So this I say, and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, 
excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Because of the hardness of their heart, and they having been callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity, the greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which, in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. The challenge for 2016 is found in this passage. Verses 22 and 20 through 24. I want to share them again, but that was the New American Standard that I just read <coughs> for you. I want to read it to you in the New International Version, the NIV. It's like this. You were taught with regard to the former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in, a, in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God, in true righteousness and holiness. Praise God.
how you want to work in our lives and what you are calling us to be. And I pray, God, that you would build your kingdom here in this community, in this state, in this country. Show us, God, how we can be a part of building your kingdom anywhere on this globe that you send us to go. And help us, Lord, to be 